This is live. You know, I haven't done, uh, I think this is actually my first Facebook Live. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah. Thank yeah. you for busting your cherry with me. Yeah, right. And if it's virtually, I'll yeah, take it. <laughs> exactly. You take cherry. anything during the COVID, right? <laughs> you know how many men I've had in my bedroom on Zoom? Nobody, like, you can't count this. Yeah, you nobody know? even knows, right? It's like, <laughs> you've had so many now. Your count, your numbers are going up. <laughs> that's right. So, Jerry Corley is here, you guys. If you don't know, I've been posting about it all day. I have a personal connection to him because I wouldn't be driving you guys Michigana with all my jokes if it wasn't for Jerry Corley's teaching and my OCD. Anyway, Jerry Corley is an actor, a writer, a comedian, and a super teacher. Oh my gosh. So let's welcome him. Let's get into it. Welcome, Jerry Corley. Hi. Thank you, Lynn. Yeah, we've been uh, we've been chatting a while. Been trying to get this together for a long time. You know. We have. I've been like, I get your emails, I'll get your texts, <laughs> and I'm like, oh, I got to get back to Lynn. And then finally, <laughs> with the COVID, it's been a little easier. You know, yes. because you know, normally right now I'd probably be on a plane. Yeah. And now instead, I am not on a plane. I'm sitting at home, but. Uh, um, but that's good. We'll get to do a little of this stuff, you know? I know. I want to know about your humble roots, your beginning. Well, my humble roots. Well, I, I was born in, um, Flower Fifth Avenue Hospital, same hospital in Manhattan as John McEnroe. And, um, <laughs> then, uh, lived on, uh, grew up in, uh, Bayside, Queens and, uh, in a, in a garden apartment with a, my mom, my dad, a family of five kids. Whoa. Um, yeah. And my dad was an actor, drove a cab. Uh, so he going in and out of the city, uh, doing, uh, you know, for the actor's studio, we belonged to the actor's studio. Yeah. Uh, we had a lot of actors come over to the house, um, when we were kids, uh, for Thanksgiving dinner and all that, you know, Al Pacino and, um, uh, yeah, that. they were like, they were in the studio together. So Al was one of those guys where, you know, he'd be like, my dad would be, yeah, Al, you don't look like you've eaten. He goes, well, I spent my last dime on my acting class. And he goes, uh, come over, you know, um, you know, Iris and I are making a dinner. And so that's kind of how they met. So um, in the, in actor studio. And then, um, so then my dad was an off Broadway actor, a Broadway actor, and then made the move. His agent came from New York to LA. Then the phone call was, you got to come out to Hollywood. And he packed the kids up, uh, was, uh, five kids, a dog, a cat, and a guitar. Nobody played the guitar, but it was so symbolic for travel, you know, and we drove cross country to LA. But when I was a kid, mm -hmm. well, if we go back to when I was a kid, I grew up, uh, then we moved out to Long Island when I was like six years old. And uh, so I lived in a town called Central Islip, Long Island, right smack dab in the middle of uh, Suffolk County. And, um, you know, it was just like Irish, pretty much an Irish. There was Irish people. There was black people. There was uh, some Puerto Rican people. And um, everybody sort of played with each other, played ball. And, and we just were out in the street. We'd play football. We'd play soccer. We'd play basketball. We'd play hockey. Um, we played whatever, stickball. And uh, so then I, um, I was playing soccer since I was the age of six. Love that sport. Played professionally uh, at the age of uh, 19 for, you uh, play for? for a very short period of time uh, because I, uh, you know, uh, I sucked. Um, <laughs> no, it's like I actually shredded my knee. I got my knee shredded. But wow. it was a, um, it was a, uh, like a third division team that uh, was a scouting team for uh, the MLS, what turned out to be the MLS before uh, Major League Soccer was actually Major League Soccer. 
So I have um, to stop you right there real quickly because my dad, he, he survived the Holocaust, but in 1938, Hitler wouldn't let him play soccer. And so wow. in 1970, and Hitler took soccer and handball out of the Olympics, but my dad got them back in in 72. Wow. So I'm that's huge, exciting. You know, when I hear the word soccer, I go crazy. <laughs> so your dad was involved in soccer at an international level. Yeah, that's what I'm yeah. talking about. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. So that's cool. So you did do soccer. And then when your knee shattered, that must have shattered you. Well, you know, what's interesting, I was doing a lot of stuff. Um, my dad uh, was one of those guys. My dad and mom were actors, and that's how they met. They met in Summerstock Theater on, in like Stockton, California, and then they moved together to New York. So they were artists, and they said, try everything. And so I played music. I played the trombone. Um, you know, there was an article that said that, um, you know, uh, women are more attracted to men who play the guitar. I, I played the trombone, so I didn't... Um, <laughs> You know, uh, but um, I played that for a long time and I played the, in a horn band and the horn band actually got to do some pretty cool, pretty cool things. Mm -hmm. But then I was playing soccer and I was also studying acting, you know, so I was doing commercials. So when um, when my knee got the ACL shredded and back then they didn't have the surgery to repair the ACL. So uh, I remember my coach looking at the knee and he goes, he just gave me a look like it's over, kid. Uh, <laughs> and it was really a bummer because I was being scouted at that time and I was killing it in that game. Oh. And um, it was a pretty much an all Mexican team and I was the only white dude. And uh, I had this flaming red hair. You know, I looked like a matchstick running around a field of wheat with these guys. And, uh, you know, they're all my friends and we yelled, they always yell at me, Yeri, Yeri, you know. Um, <laughs> which is interesting because my name's Jerry and I didn't know why I did, finally when I made my uh, friend Miguel I said Miguel why do you guys call me Yerry and he says because in Spanish we don't pronounce the letter J man and uh, me being the <laughs> argumentative New Yorker I was I was like I said yeah you do man but sometimes you like substitute it for the letter Y <laughs> he was like shh you don't know what you're talking about uh and he goes oh shit you do so we used to hang out and just party together and play soccer together it was like the coolest thing and but I was the only redhead so this big head of red hair then we had a a, a fr and I had it and our coach was this German redheaded dude with a beard and uh he yeah. was awesome because he saw me I was a left winger you know I played left wing my whole life I was very fast and had a strong left foot and right foot I could kick equally with both feet and then he took me and made me a striker he said, you're a goal scorer. And he made me a striker and I started scoring goals and I was very fast. So when we, we had a friendly with this Irish national team, it was their warm up before their big game in the, in the United States. And uh, one of the dudes took me out because I scored two goals and they were like, we're not gonna be embarrassed by this guy. And that was it. Hmm. It, was, it was intentional. Yeah, it was intentional, but you know, I remember sitting there on my couch with ice on my knee going, well, the universe is telling me to narrow my choices, you know? And I really, it was, I, I think back on it, I really love the sport. I miss it. I watch the sport and I move and my, all my muscles just start to work. And it's like, um, but there were other things I was also fascinated with acting and music. And then, so yeah, so that, that's what, with that, I, then um, um, was, you know, I was doing some commercials. Uh, my dad, of course, was an actor for 60 years. So um, he was, uh, if you remember the show, the original Murphy Brown, not the yeah. shitty remake they tried to do. Um, <laughs> it's like, yeah, hey, let's stick with the old eighties type sitcom in 2000 fucking 20. Uh, it's like, <laughs> that was so like, oh my God, really guys, come on, update, update. <laughs> Audiences evolved. Watch <laughs> Will and Grace, they were able to do it. <laughs> um so uh, uh he was so in the original one but he was in the original he played phil the bartender for 10 years wow. in um in that show and he's hey there murphy you know that that voice um but he uh he was you know he was very he and my mom were super encouraging so um then you know as a as an actor um i was in commercials and with the red hair i was booking a lot of stuff 
all of a sudden in my 20s, 25, 26, my hair started to recede. Mm -hmm. And my uh, fortunate enough to have this uh, casting director, her name was Sheila Manning, just an amazing lady. Uh, she was honest with me. She said, Jerry, we love you, but we don't know how to cast you. Receding hairline and baby face doesn't sell beer. And I said, oh shit, I've got the Ron Howard effect. Um, and thinking about Ron Howard, how he segued, because he had that baby face his whole life and he went into directing. So I said, I've got to find a, pl a job where I can work when I'm not working. So that's when I found stand-up. And I started to dabble in stand-up. And then uh, I started to write. And I said, you know, I, one of my uh, coaches uh, said that um, if you want to, uh, if you're right, you should consider writing for the late, for the Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. Because remember, Johnny was it. That's, that's all we had, yeah. right? So I watched Johnny and then I would uh, uh, try to, I would transcribe all his monologues. And then I would try to add my own punchlines at the end. <laughs> And then um, I would tell my dad the jokes and he'd always go like this, <laughs> meaning tighten, <laughs> tighten it, you know? And then he says, son, if you really want to do this, you got to get, you got to get a coach. And I go, dad, that's not how it works. You don't get a coach. Nobody gets a coach. <laughs> so I got a coach and um, it was uh, uh, one of the, it was one of the writers for Bob Hope. And um, so I found him in a writer's digest. I said, where are you going to find a coach? And what was, what was so weird was, you know how they say the universe delivers? You know, we say that's a, such a corny thing. And so I was like, well, where am I going to find a coach? And my, my dad was like, I don't know. And so I said, well, you know, just put it out there and the answers will come to you, son. <laughs> and so literally like a week later, there's a writer's digest sitting on my desk. And I go, oh, all right. It's just writer's digest. I didn't, even, I didn't know anything about trade magazines like that. So I open it up. I get to the back. There was an ad for a correspondence course for joke writing uh, from Gene Parrott. And then um, I found out that he lived in, in California. And then I found out you could, uh, we could actually meet one-on-one. -on -one. So I had um, a, a coach who was coaching me in writing. And it was more writing that one and two liner late night style joke. And they really put me to the task. And what I've learned since then is there's a book called Peak, P-E-A-K. And it's by this guy named K. Anders Erickson, Dr. K. Anders Erickson and Robert Poole. Now, Peak, these two guys, these two psychologists are the founders of a field of psychology called uh, expertise. So how do people achieve a level of mastery? And they've been studying this for 30 years. Now in peak, if you get that book, you'll understand that um, these two psychologists who've been studying learning and how people learn for 30 years believe that the brain is designed to learn anything you teach it. Now, sometimes there are physical limitations, like you're, it's going to be harder for you to reach a, you know, expert level in the NBA if you're only 5'4", you know, but I think Spud Webb did it to 5'6 or 5'7". So, um, but, you know, they're like, you could teach, the brain is designed to learn anything you teach it. And they're the ones who found that, found, you know, originated the, the coin, the, the term of 10,000 hours, right? 10,000 hours. And so Malcolm Gladwell in Outliers, remember that book, he commercialized that statement. He said, uh, you, can, you can master anything, become an expert at anything in 10,000 hours with 10,000 hours of practice. But he missed a point. And the important point was 10,000 hours of practice with expert feedback. Wow. Because if you're practicing wrong, you're going to become an expert at just doing it wrong. Right. So if like, for example, we've seen guys at Mike's doing the same exact joke every single night for five years, the joke never worked to begin with and it never changed and it still doesn't work. What makes you think that five years of doing it the same way is going to make a, just a magical audience shows up and they, ha, that's funny because no, we've seen these guys. It's like expert feedback probably just needs to move a word. Right. And that then changes the nature of the joke. You know, 99% of the time, if you think something is funny, it is. It just needs to be phrased the way the audience needs to hear it to get that stimuli to laugh at the, what you're trying to say.
So that's most all the time somebody has something, it's just not working. It has nothing to do with the fact that it's not a funny premise or funny idea. It's the, it just needs to be tweaked a little bit. So the audience gets what you're trying to say, you know? So, um, I'm so, absorbing. I am just like, keep talking. <laughs> so when I got into stand, when I got into stand up, I started, you know, in the writing part of it. Right. And I was writing and, and with regimented practice and, and expert feedback every week, I'd have these guys coach me and give me assignments and do those assignments and kept pushing and kept pushing and kept pushing. And I was writing 10 jokes a day, then 20 and then 30 then 50, then 80 to 120. And then in about, I think it was 18, 20 months, I got the, I got the job on the tonight show. Wow. So writing for Jay Leno. So, um, but what was that like? That was at first I was a contributor, right? Okay. So I was contributing. And then, um, but I got to tell you, there's, I got to say there was, there was some politics involved there that I, I can't talk about. Um, but um, I got to say that I would bet that Leno had one of the most efficient writer's rooms in late night TV. Meaning he knew when it was funny and he knew when it wasn't funny. And so the, the process of elimination and deciding on the monologue, that was pretty, very efficient. And um, so that's, there's a whole story behind that. I tell it sometimes in class, but I don't tell it on, you know, public forums because of, uh, you know, something called an NDA. Uh, <laughs> so, but, um, you know, I, I enjoyed that. I enjoyed the, the challenge. And I enjoyed the work. I enjoyed um, uh, just, the, just the writing. And boy, it, what I learned was like most of the guys were writing about um, 25 to 40 jokes a day. I was writing 80 to 120 a day. And they were going, how do you, how do you do that? How do you do that? What do you, and a lot, it's just a process. If you have a process and uh, a technique to get to the joke from the headline or from the, you know, the line in the story, that's actually a good setup for what that headline is trying to say. Um, then you could, uh, you can write, you can write like what I've, I've written just online. I've showed uh, examples of writing how to write 18 jokes in 15 jokes in 30 minutes. Right. And it's like, on the same headline. So you can generate a lot of, lot of material, you know? And what I learned as well is learning comedy, the whole base of comedy, whether you're a storyteller or whether you're a joke teller is the fundamentals are in that one and two liner joke, man. That's a setup, misdirection, punchline. All of that is, think about it. I mean, it, it encompasses everything. What is, Set up misdirection punchline. Set up misdirection creates the tension. Punchline releases the tension. That is act one, act two, act three. That's writing a scene. That's writing a screenplay. The better I became as a joke writer, the better I became as a script writer. And that's what helped me sell my first script, Stretch. Did you see the poster back there? Stretch is yes. right there, right? So Stretch was the, um, my first, first uh, Was that screenplay. in 2014? Yes. Okay. 2000, yeah, 2015. Um, and so I had a goal when I was younger. One of the goals was uh, I didn't want to be a, a, a road warrior on the road constantly at 50. And I wanted to, uh, to pro write, produce, executive produce, and have um, made a film uh, by 50 years old. Now, I was 51 when Stretch came out, um, but um, it's still... Um, I hit that goal. So I was real. I was like, wow, I, I hit that goal. Uh, so it was really exciting to do that. But I learned how important that learning that one and two liner, man, you could feel it in the piece, you know, the rise and fall, the second act, the, the B side of second act, that tension, and then the release takes us to act three. We crave that resolution. Human beings crave resolution, man. It's like a major scale. You know, it's like, do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do, right? If you do that to an audience and go, do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, good night, everyone, and just <laughs> left, they'd be like, do, I needed it. I needed that. I just needed to sort of, you know, because, um, and when you kind of learn that, it helps you to write and you could start to sense the hooks in the joke. You could start to, and then you evolve into all the other types of comedy, the, the uh, in short form. I mean, there are, there are, uh, when I first started to get into this, I was fortunate enough to meet George Carlin. And George Carlin, it was a, just a 
just a bizarre meeting. And then George, uh, it was the way it happened. It's just out of the blue. Um, and it turned out that he and my dad shared the same acting agent. And he goes, well, wait a second. My act, my, you're, you're, you know, he said, what's your name? I said, Jerry Corley. You said any relation to the character actor, Pat Corley? I said, oh yeah, that's my father. Uh, he's my father. He says, uh, he says, well, his agent said I should study him to become, become a better character actor. I said, who's your agent? And he told me, and I said, that's my dad's agent. So we had this conversation, right? Then it turned into, he's like, hey, if you ever see me playing anywhere, give me a holler and come, I'll, I'll get, get you some tickets. Come see the show. Then always come back and say hello. You know, and that term was like, it sounded so theatrical, like actors talk this way, you know, jazz artists talk this way that, you know, he was so like a, he was just such a creative arts guy. He was that, he was that guy, you know, he was thoughtful, he was passionate, he loved comedy, um, skeptical about society, but loved comedy. And then he, um, and then, I, you know, I got the chance to go sit with him and chat with him sometimes about comedy. And he said to me, and I had just read this article about J, uh, um, Jerry Seinfeld saying he crosses out 60 to 70% of the material he tries for the very first time. And I said, wow, 60 to 70%. And then George Carlin said, I know with 98% accuracy that a joke is funny before I step on stage. And I said, how do you know that? And he says, because it contains all the elements necessary for a joke to be funny. I said, what are those elements? And he says, you're gonna have to learn those on your own, kid. And then after a glass of wine and a painkiller, which was his drug of choice at the time, he said, <laughs> he mellowed and he was like, I think the reason I said that is because instinctively I know what they are, but I can't verbalize it. <laughs> Maybe you can find out what, they, what the reasons are, what, it, what, what they are, what the elements are and uh, give them names and then uh, share it with the world. And I took that as a command. Wow. And so that's what kind of sent me into why does this work? Why do human beings laugh? Really, what tickles, what triggers that laugh? How does that brain, you know, what's the stimuli and that needs to be present? And so when he said all the elements necessary for a joke to be funny, that opened up the world to me. And I was yeah. like, all right, what are those elements? And so that's what I, that's kind of what sent me into that sort of just deep dive. And it made me understand that comedy is, the most unexplored creative art out of all of our major creative arts. I mean, whether you're talking about dance, sculpting, painting, music, theater, opera, all of this creative stuff has been pretty deeply explored. Comedy, people just have bought the old notion, you either got it or you don't, you're born with it. You know, you either got it or you don't. And that's all nonsense. You've talked to most people who seem to be naturally funny They've got a history where they had exposure and experience with comedy. Jerry Seinfeld revealed in an interview just recently that his parents got a new TV. And he's one of the guys that says, you're born with it. You can't teach this. You either got it or you don't. You know, he says it on comedians in cars drinking coffee. Um, uh, so, so, you know, I want to write an article and call it the big lie. Jerry Seinfeld wants everybody to believe. Um, and I'm a big fan of Seinfeld. I love his comedy. So, I mean, it's nothing personal. It's just like, stop telling kids that you can't do this, you know, um, you can let them explore. They'll find out whether or not it's something they're passionate enough about to work your ass off to reach the level you want to reach. But, you know, Jerry Seinfeld was not a slacker. He worked his ass off. He used to write five hours a day. All his friends thought he was crazy. Yeah. He's about a billion dollars crazy right now. So, you know, he did the work. Um, but, you can teach it. You can learn the stimuli, first of all, that trigger human laughter, and then the structures you can write to trigger that laughter. And when you learn that and you start to learn that, wow, there's 13 major comedy structures. Holy shit. Most people use like three, you know, you know, you watch your sitcoms, book, you know, it's your it's book a, breaking comedy's DNA. Oh my gosh. I would yeah. never have gotten on stage and known what I would. I'm the type that has to be taught. Not to mention, I have a little brain injury. But beside from that, aside from that, you know, I I wouldn't get in. Don't a all car comics, and... Lynn? All comics <laughs> are brain damaged. <laughs> yeah. So your your book really helped me to know the nuts and bolts because otherwise I'd be just up there throwing shit on the wall, hoping something sticks. Right. Right. Which is one way to do it. You know. <laughs> it's in you know like uh, like in the book. I think I talk about three uh, types of comics. You're the coincidental comedian which we all are, 
You know, we see and we see and make an observation. Uh, we're in a conversation. There's some stimuli, triggers some response. People laugh, and uh, we're like, "Hey, yeah, that worked." Um, everybody does that, right? Everybody sees something. Oh, that's weird. Look at that. Uh, and but the thing is, if that's what you rely on, then you have to rely on that coincidence in order to come up with material. Then there's the architect, like he's number two, the number two type. Of comedian. When I say comedian, I mean writer or stand up. Um, then you have that the architect, and that architect can sit down and generate material from scratch uh, almost out of any logical grouping of words. And, um, and then you have what I call the humorist. Now, think about the differences. That coincidental side is a very um, right brained, freedom, emotional, expressive side, images emotions. And um, the left side of the brain is very analytical, mechanical, technical. <clears throat> so that architect is very left brain, the, the um, coincidental person is very right brain. And then you have to, you learn to work both of them together. And, you know, you can still work the mechanics and still get up on stage and be free and expressive with the audience. And um, then it's sort of like, it's almost like a musician. You don't get up on stage thinking about practicing your arpege arpeggiated fifths and your thirds and your scales. You do that in the daytime. You get up on stage, play the music and express yourself. Same thing with a singer, right? So as a comic, you get up there, you, you work on your material, you work on your writing, because every time you work on your writing and get better at that, you start to recognize those patterns in moments and in instances and in live action, like crowd work, you're talking just in a conversation, it becomes a part of you. You see it again and you can, can play that, you know? The simplest way to do that is like with something like um, a technique called simple truth, right? Simple truth is somebody makes a statement and they have a, an implied meaning in that statement. Now, our brains are super linear, right? they create very acute expectations. That's how we evolve as human beings. So we learn to catch a ball by watching the trajectory and speed of the ball and moving to where we expect it to be. Same thing, Somebody sometimes something can come at our face, we, we blink, right? It's an expectation. We create these very acute expectations. We do this with sentences too, and instances and experiences. So if we know that, that's a superpower. So we can create an expectation with an audience with a story and then smash that expectation and you have heightened possibility for a joke, right? So it create that very acute expectation. So simple truth is somebody expresses himself with a phrase. You take that phrase and go to what the simple truth of that phrase can be. It's as simple as we go back to the old, you know, call me a doctor, you're a doctor, right? What is their intended meaning? call a physician on the phone, get them down here. We have an emergency. Um, call me a doctor could also be, it's the comedic interpretation is basically you're a doctor. So, but if you can take this with any phrase, you can do this with song lyrics, right? Remember you go to Disneyland, you go to, it's a small world. You ever really listen to that song? Not it's really. a world of joy. It's a world of tears. It's a world of hope. It's a world of fears. So Isn't nice. that a song about being bipolar? Really? Isn't that what that is? <laughs> <laughs> so now you're going to the simple truth of what what you just heard right so you can have that you can do that with uh, with uh, bible scripture you can do that with song lyrics you can do that with quotes you know jerry seinfeld used to do that when you hear it on a commercial you know it's like our detergent can get blood stains out of your dress shirts faster than the leading detergent and he'd be like if you've got blood stains in your dress shirt you got more things to worry about than detergent, you know? So that's <laughs> the comedian's way of looking at it is to acutely listen. And um, uh, we have superior quality prime beef. What as opposed to <laughs> mediocre prime? <laughs> or the, you know, already <laughs> the, the deteriorating uh, prime? <laughs> that, the one with the maggots in it, that kind of prime. That's the prime <laughs> beef I want. Because, you know, when I have my beef, I want, a little, I want a little crunch. I want a little pop. So if you really listen acutely uh, to something, you just you can did tags and toppers. Right, didn't I? Just now. <laughs> just wow. taking the idea. So, I mean, and once you sort of, and if you learn it, if you constantly, like I write every day, right? So it's like, 
then that stuff gets automatized and it gets in. It, it's like just how I think now. It's naturally how I think, but I'm not on all the time. Right. So I just like I'll shut myself up sometimes. I'll be watching a television show with my wife. I won't say a word because I know she'll just get annoyed. Right. <laughs> You're interrupting the show. <laughs> So there was a uh, there was a, like another thing you let and that's why I love to listen to commercials. This is where I think com- comedians are missing out. They keep skipping it, right? We're streaming everything. There's so much. You can in skip those commercials. commercials because a commercial is a perceived authority, right? They make a branding statement, a product statement, a product claim, and it's our job as comedians to knock them down a peg to prove them wrong. You know, we're cynics, right? So, like I was driving to uh, uh, Hollywood and listen to the talk radio. I love talk radio. They run that commercial. One commercial came on and said, so if you want to lose 20 or more pounds legitimately, call 1-800-555-1212. And I'm thinking 20 or more pounds legitimately as opposed to illegitimately? Because really, if you're losing 20 or more pounds illegitimately, isn't that pretty much just a pregnancy termination? (laughs) You know, so it's like now you have a joke that's going to work because you took somebody else's line and just went with the cynical version of it and repeated it back to them. And it's like, have you really thought this through? <laughs> That's great. You know, so, which is what, think about this. This is what comedians are supposed to do, right? We're supposed to analyze and go down a few layers. That's why I see lawyers that make good writers because they're used to looking at dot in every eye, crossing every ting, looking at, well, oh, this guy, here's the mistake. So they really analyze that. So if you're, you're analytical, you can find those things. I'll give you an example of late night TV. Uh, Stephen, you know, sometimes I watch late night and I go, okay, you guys are getting lazy. Because um, I remember I was watching Seth Meyers and Seth Meyers, you know, they brought all those, right, all his writers over from SNL, right? They're not monologue writers, they're sketch writers, right? They're good sketch writers. So, um, so but at one point he was actually doing <laughs> affirmations remember that you're smarter than everybody you're better than everybody and i like you looking in the mirror i'm like wait a second that's like uh that's what's his name that was uh, that that character they had uh in the in the 80s and it was like played by uh uh uh, what's oh geez is he's al franken you know uh oh smalley uh stewart smalley that's the name of the character stewart small i don't know if you remember that from snl I go, why would you do, I go, really guys, you're going to use a character from an 80s SNL character that was played by Al Franken because you don't have any, you can't fill the time. And it was like, but um, then uh, Stephen Colbert was doing this bit. And I love these guys. Don't get me wrong. I think Seth is great. Um, You know what I like Seth for? What's that? And when he's joke bombs, he knows how to pull himself out of it. Mm-hmm. Like I sit there and write the things he says when a joke bombs. Like Carson, Carson was always great at that. He and you know if you go back and watch uh, watch Seth do the old weekend updates, he's the greatest deadpanner man. When he says that joke, he just stares at the camera until you laugh. Wow. You know, so he creates that tension and lets the audience find their release point. So that's wow. um, what Colbert was doing this uh, bit, and the bit was this kid in high school. Right. So the story was this kid in high school in the South. He um, he got uh, his mom uh, wanted to order. He graduated magna cum laude. Um, yeah, it was like, oh, yeah, uh, ma- I think uh, magna, I think summa cum, cum laude, maybe. But um, he gra- so he graduated top of his class. And the, um, uh, the mom wanted to make a cake for him to celebrate that. And so she called the Publix grocery store, their bakery department, and tried to order the cake or ordered it online and then put on in the online form what she wanted the cake to say. And it said, congratulations, uh, summa, summa cum laude, right? So cum is spelled C-U-M. And uh, they were like, no, we're not going to do that. That's gross. <laughs> That's nasty, right? We're, we don't put X-rated stuff on our, That's obscenity. And she had to call them and convince them. And she's sorry, we won't do it. Our computer says it's nasty, so we're not going to do it. And it's like, so, and th- so he said, so we're going to make cupcakes for the kid <laughs> that's a, a c- 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 congratulations, summa cum laude, right? <laughs> so that was his thing. And I went, oh, uh, yeah, nice, Stephen, but that's not the fucking joke. The joke is the kid was homeschooled. It's easy to be top of your class when you're fucking homeschooled. 
But I was reading the news story and I was like, how come nobody's mentioning the name of the high school? Wow. And I read uh, like on the fourth story, there it was, homeschooled. I go, <laughs> come on, guys, that's where the joke is. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Holy but, um, but it's just like, you know, sometimes you comedians normally think deeper, right? We go deeper into uh, the story. And if you listen really acutely, mm -hmm. that's what I like to do. It's like, I don't, I don't write from the headline. I get into the, at least the first two paragraphs of the story, because that's usually where the joke is. Wow. And I just want to know, because I get to pick your brain one-on-one -on -one here. How do you know where the funny is in something? Cause like I will sit there and a, a, a word will come to me and I'll build a joke around it or two words that don't belong together. I'll make them go together with a joke. And like, and I, and somebody will come along with more years in comedy and say, well, that's not where the funny is. And like, I'm still, yeah, I've got jokes that work. Don't get me wrong, but I've also got 43 pounds of jokes that I threw out that right. didn't yeah. work. Yeah. So how do you, how do you know beyond the shadow of a doubt where the funny is? Because you well, seem to- Well, first of all, I don't think there's beyond the shadow of the doubt. The audience mm -hmm. is always the final judge. I would never assume to think I know whether the audience is truly gonna laugh or not at a joke. Because mm -hmm. uh, I mean, there have been times, I'm pretty good at this, and there have been lots of times you get up there and you think this joke is just gonna, oh yeah, this is, I, uh, I can't <laughs> wait for the laugh. You can almost, you hear the laugh, right? You say the joke, flat line, nothing, right? And I'll ask, I'll go, what happened there? That's what I'll say to the audience. I go, what happened there? You know, I think ah, that's a funny joke. What happened there? Instead of going, fuck you, it's funny. I'll ask them, right? So Can one time I did answers? a joke. Yeah, a lot of time I get a, uh, I'll get an answer. And it's like, we don't understand what you mean. And then I'll realize I answered with, I, I had something that was vague in there and it didn't snap that connection quickly enough for them to get it. Like for example, I used to do, I did, used to do a joke about my wife about she's got large breasts. And then um, I told the story originally, the story was based around sitting there talking about writing a joke from one word, right? So I'm sitting with my uh, writer, uh, friend Rob Rose, uh, who co-wrote Stretch with me and the funniest, fastest, funniest guy I know. Um, and we're sitting there, he comes in uh, to the room and he starts using the word G's a lot. I said, where's this coming from? I've never heard you say G's. And he says, well, you know, my, I've been Skyping with my son and he's, um, He's going to church. I don't want to disrespect and say Jesus. So I just say, geez. So uh, I said, oh, that's cool. So I wrote down G-E-E-Z, geez, geez. And I said, what could geez be? Geez, geez could be uh, geez, cheese. It could be geez, could be like G-spot, G-force, G, G-money. Uh, and then it says G, G, simply G could be the G's could be the plural for the letter G. G could be the cup size of a bra of a large breasted woman. Ah, that usually gets titters. Uh, hello, what? So uh -huh. then I said, oh, geez, my wife is a G cup. And I said, uh, when I first met her, she thought I was psychic because I walked in the room and uh, she walked in the room and I was like, geez. <laughs> I was so taken aback, I named them, marry <laughs> me, you know? <laughs> and um, so, but so and when I deliver that joke, if I don't say cup size, the audience doesn't connect. If I don't tell the backstory, the audience doesn't connect a cup size with the letter G. We've heard of double Ds, we've heard of Ds, Cs, Bs maybe, but not G. We don't really make that fast uh, association. So that you know sometimes an, a, a joke needs to be tight because it needs to, you've got to make sure that association is very clear. Um, Another thing that, you know, so if I know that's there and what, so if you know the stimuli, the laughter stimuli, one of the big things we laugh about when we're doing like incongruity jokes mm -hmm. is one recognition. We, this relate to this, right? We know what a boob is. We, we've seen a, a large breasted woman. Uh, two, embarrassment. There's tension there. It's a little embarrassing. You're talking about your wife for Christ's sake. Come on. Um, number three, uh, there is, um, coincidence. What a coincidence that G and G's are so similar. It's a bit of a paradox in a way because they're two, they don't mean, they're not the same. It's like two things can, that can be true, but not true at the same time. G and G cup. Uh, so uh, G's meaning multiple G cups. So two G cups, G's and G's as the expression are two different meanings. They're the same sound of a word, 
but they have two different meanings. So two things that can be true at the but can be true, but not at the exact same time. That's one definition of a paradox. Audiences laugh at paradox because our brain does a little dance, plus the coincidence, plus the surprise, plus the embarrassment. All these things are there. So I know with high odds, this will get a laugh. So and a, um, and a good laugh because mm -hmm. it's got so many layers. And a lot of times they can beat me to the punch and it doesn't make it less effective because they love the game. Wow. Oh, wow, yeah, geez, ha, right? And they're like, they're like, yeah, they'll applaud after they come, after that happens. Cause you're making it a game with them. You're not saying I am so clever. You're just playing this game with them and they love the wordplay, you know? So, um, so there's another thing like, you know, there's something I call the associative gap. When somebody has a setup and then they're going to associate it with another, you know, word that modifies that setup, but then they put too much fluff in there. And then they say that it's dead because our brains are following linearly that trajectory. And a lot of times they'll say something, introduce a character for a second, and then try to finish it up with the association. And that gap is there. That thing's got to associate tightly. It can't have that. It can't have fluff in there. So that's part of the mechanic, remove the fluff, do the association, use this little other reference as a tag, you know? So it's, that's kind of what people make that mistake a lot. And they're like, oh, it's that joke. I'm gonna lose that joke, it doesn't work. I go, what do, you, what do you mean lose it? Just get rid of that, you got an associative gap there. Take that fluff out, do the, do the association nice and tight, then use that fluff as the tag, because it still relates. That's a great idea. You know, use and, it as a tag instead yeah. of throwing the middle part out. Yeah. The other thing is one of my biggest weaknesses is trying to be too clever with a joke, right? Mm -hmm. So especially years ago, I used to try to be too clever, be more, everything had to be like configurational, meaning a think joke, you know, everything had to be about thinking. And instead um, it doesn't, sometimes you got to hit right on the nose, right? You got to hit that reverse, like make sure there's no vagueness as to what we're talking about. Like I'm trying to teach my daughter how to tie her shoes. Right. So this is this technique is called the reverse, right? Trying to teach my daughter how to tie her shoes. Now, when you're talking, a lot of times you go, what image does the audience have? Trying to teach my daughter how to tie her shoes. What do you, what do you see? What do you see? A child sitting down next to you, bending over. How old's the child? Five. Five. Okay. Yeah, that's when we learned how to tie our shoes. So that's the expectation. So if I just said something simply as a joke on the way to the bigger joke. And I said, I'm trying to teach my daughter how to tie her shoes, which is weird because she's 18. And um, no, she's five, five years old, trying to teach her how to tie her shoes. And she's like, dad, I can't, dad, I can't. And I said, how many times have I told you not to use that word? I am not your dad. <laughs> so you created another expectation. How many times have we said to our kids not to use the word can't, right? So we have dad and can't in that statement. And I choose the one they think, they don't think I'm going to. So that's, I've set them up for that. They, cause I know people know, how many times have I told you not to use that word? Can't, you know, they, they're thinking that, right? And I say, I'm not your dad. That's funny because there's ambivalence present, right? It was like, you shouldn't say that to a kid. I'm not your dad. That could fuck him up, you know, she's in jail. Uh, so, um, <laughs> but that's how you sort of, it's, you can write those misdirections. But if I'm not very specific sometimes and on the nose, there's going to be some vagueness in what, I, what do I mean if I let that, if I don't say the setup exactly right. Sometimes they'll go to the tag rather than nail it on, on the head, you know? You know, you had a lot of misdirection in that joke, yep. like from the get-go. Mm -hmm. So you get a lot of laughs out of that joke. And you can't, and it's a, it's a pretty simple joke, but you can like manipulate it so that you can, you're telling a story about yourself. If I, you know, like if I get up on stage and I, I say, um, I come from a large family, four moms, five dads. Um, <laughs> when you say that there's a misdirect because you say large family, we're thinking brothers, sisters, right? And it's a joke, right? But if I say to them, um, if I say to the audience, I have five kids, right? And um, what are they thinking? I have five children of my own, right? So, if, you know, so if I say I have five kids, they're my kids, right? That's what they're thinking, right? That's, if I say I have five kids in the trunk of my car, <laughs> gets a little weird and creepy. But um, <laughs> so, but if I say I have five kids and I don't want to say that because it's going to throw off the tone of the direction of where I go with the piece, 
uh, if I say I have five kids, because I'm only half Mormon, <laughs> it's a it's a tickle on the way to the bigger part of what I'm trying to do with this this segment right here is talk about failed marriages, relationships, children, raising a family, all of that, all of that. So you can always set them up with a line and then ask yourself with that line, this is what we fail to do sometimes when we're writing. We don't write the sentence and then look back at it and go, okay, what's the expectation? Is there an assumption? Is there an image that I can shatter? You know, are there two dissimilar ideas converging? And is there a double entendre play? So that's, you know, if I write a story first, if I'm doing a story, I'll write the story first, then I'll go back and I'll start asking the questions to each line to punch up the story. Wow. Right? I'm not gonna just go put in, you know, a lot of people think comedy is about waka waka. Hey, whoa, look at that, I did something wacky, you know? And that's where we make our mistakes. Comedy is not about trying to be funny. It's about like hitting obstacles along the way to a goal, right? It's come, most comedy is about, you know, trying to get from point A to point B and encountering obstacles. And then people recognize those obstacles and it's what a coincidence, I've done this kind of the same thing he just did. You know, you do that, dude. You know, and that kind of thing. So all of these things come into play. But think about it with with nine laughter triggers and uh, tw 13 comedy structures, you have a lot of tools to work with. Um, so if I go through a draft of material and it's like just using double entendre, is there a word that has a double meaning that I can make a play on, which is what most sitcoms use. That's their main go to. Um, are there two dissimilar ideas converging? That's incongruity. That is the main go-to for late night TV writers. Uh, and uh, is there an assumption, uh, an expectation or an image that I believe they really, that most of them see that I can shatter? You know, take that one exercise from the book. You know, I, I got fired for getting my finger stuck in the dishwasher. So what do you see? Your finger, your, your whole hand is stuck in the dishwasher. And the dishwasher is? Turned on, I would think. A machine, right? <laughs> I see things what differently. What if the, what if, right, well, yeah, it should, that's how people are supposed to see it. Because I mean, when you say got my finger stuck in the dishwasher, we assume, oh, a me mechanical dishwasher, finger got stuck, why would they fire you? And I say, I got my finger stuck in the dishwasher. I still don't know why they didn't fire her too. <laughs> And, you know, I, when I found out she was the boss's daughter. <laughs> I didn't see that one coming. <laughs> she didn't either. <laughs> which is why we're now life partners, so. <laughs> Good one. <laughs> but you see what I'm saying? So it's, yeah. you can do that. And the more you practice this in, the, in your writing, the regimented practice, it starts to automatize. And it becomes a part of you and you start to see it everywhere. And that's, that's what makes it a little easier. So you can punch up dialogue. And the other things, I mean, there's other things too that people don't take time to really think about. Comedic irony for, uh, is another. We don't need a punchline. It just needs to be ironic. We laugh when irony's present. So if you know, if, as you get familiar with, John Stewart used it all the time. And that's a, you know, when people say, how do I take my act to the next level? Comedic irony, study that, get good really? at that. That's ironic. Usually there's, there's usually irony and hypocrisy, right? Where are usually, we gonna find that? Right, um, yeah, <laughs> where, where do we find <laughs> hypocrisy? Hmm, let me see, is it anywhere? <laughs> so what, what gave you the, the love, the passion for comedy? Um, first of all, when I was a kid, you know, I was quick-witted. And I think one of the reasons why is my, par my parents used to play musical theater albums. You know, they were involved in theater. They played the comedy, they played comedy albums. They played Richard Pryor, George Carlin. Um, and I used to listen to these. And my dad used to always laugh at the Looney Tunes. And I didn't get them. Because those were adult jokes, most of them. They had irony in there. There was, you know, there was paradox in there. There was sexuality in there. We didn't, <laughs> as an adult, you go, oh, I see. That's where the funny is. But um, so we were exposed to Carlin. I mean, my dad had like all Carlin's albums and Richard Pryor. And I would listen to those as a kid. I was seven, eight, nine, ten years old. I would listen to Carlin and, and just uh, like a hundred times. And wow. my neighbors would play Bill Cosby albums. And, and so we would just always listen. And so that became, I was a little, I was witty, 
but in mm-hmm. school I was always I was be I was the uh, well behaved I was always wow. my parents were just like you have to be well behaved so but I'm in eighth grade and I'm sitting there in class and the teacher says something and this guy across the room in the other corner of the back of the room his name was Andrew Majesic uh, I didn't know Andy personally yet but Andy was um, Andy Andy uh, was a big Monty Python fan and uh, and his mom worked at Columbia Records and so she used to bring home all these albums musicians and comedians and he would listen to them and he'd be in the back of the room the teacher would say something and he would quip on a usually a double entendre he'd come up and i go i was thinking the same thing i just didn't speak out but he's getting a laugh okay that's bullshit i'm gonna start getting a laugh right and then i started doing that i found out for him it was a defense mechanism his his comedy because his dad died at a very young age and he had died when he was like 12 years old so he just that's how he, if there was without the laughter, there'd probably just be tears sort of thing. And I used my comedy, number one, to, to kind of flirt or be comfortable around girls. And number two, not get my ass kicked. And because uh, I was going to school in New York. And then one, and this is what one time uh, something happened is I realized the, this is why I learned that audiences also laugh at recognition. Hmm. If they recognize something, if something is familiar to them and you've, it's you use it in a in a situation that is an alternative situation to its original situation it so conveniently fits there plus it's memorable especially if you say it exactly the same way as they remember it so there was a commercial that ran in new york on the local channel and it was just like ran all the time anybody who's from new york knows this commercial uh, around that uh, era. And it was like this guy in a construction hat, a white t-shirt, standing on this empty stage, just a white background. And off stage, you hear somebody yell, hey, Jerry, what's the story? And he used to go, the story is you come to JGE with the right make a model unit number you want to buy. You show us your union or civil service card at the door and you're in because JGE is not open to the general public, only to union members and their families. And somebody would yell from off screen, so that's the story? And he'd go, that's the story. And he'd lean up and his t-shirt would pop up and his belly button would show. (laughs) And that was their commercial. And it ran all the time. JG eventually got uh, busted for money laundering uh, because it was a mob run front. But (laughs) But in school, I'd walk through the halls and somebody would yell out, hey, Jerry, what's the story? And everybody would laugh at me. So I said, that's got to stop. So I memorized the commercial. I went to school and they were like, hey, Jerry, what's the story? I said, the story is you come to JGE with the rate maker model unit number you want to buy. You show us your union and civil service card at the door and you're in because JGE is not open to the general public, only to union members and their families. And they would play along. So that's the story. And I go, that's the story. And I'd pull up my shirt. They would laugh and applaud. So now that's my power not my insecurity. And yeah. so that plays forward. Years later, after I come to California, you know, I start doing stand up. I go back to New York. I'm doing some, I'm trying to audition in some of the clubs and I go to Eastside Comedy. This guy named Richard Min, uh, Richie Minervini, he owned this club. And um, so I'm there, there for the audition night and supposed to do like five minutes. And he says, how do you want me to introduce you? I said, just go up there and say, this guy just got in from California. His name is Jerry. He goes, that's it? I go, that's it. Make sure you do it that way. This guy just got in from California. His name is Jerry. I want the last words in their head to be Jerry. He goes, "Uh, okay. Ladies and gentlemen, this guy uh, just got in from California. Uh, Say hello to Jerry. I walk out there, get in front of the mic. I said, hi, my name is Jerry. Some clown on the back row. Hey, Jerry, what's the story? They laugh. I go, the story is you come from, it's come to JGE with the right make a model unit number you want to buy. You show us your union, a civil service card at the door and you're in because JGE is not open to the general public, only to union members and their families. And they yell out. So that's the story. I go, that's the story. And I raise my shirt up and show my belly button. Broke into this huge applause. (laughs) They were so excited to reminisce. What a coincidence. This guy from California was able to call back this phrase from New York and play us. 
And they and and so they were eating out of my hands for the rest of that five minutes I was doing. I get done and Minervini is going, holy shit, how did you know they were going to do that? I said, because they did it my whole life. <laughs> wow. Yeah. And he's like, wow, that was really cool, man. So <laughs> you're you're like things that you're the, the bigger your flaws, the better your comic character. Right. So you can take those things that are painful to you, turn it around and play them out, shine a spotlight on it. And you can get a laugh from it because we've all had shit like that happen to us. And now it's your power and not your insecurity. Wow. I have, so to, play this, tricks. Yeah. I have to play this video over and over. There's so much information here. That's usually the way it is, though. I just don't stop. I love this stuff so much. It's such a it. fascinating craft, you know? It and is. on top of that, you know what it's, you know how cool it is? First of all, I didn't want to be a teacher. I didn't choose that. Um, I was touring and I, I, momentum was just picking up and picking up and picking up. My manager was like, you're selling out these rooms. It's like every time they put up your poster, place sells out. This is all, you know, things were right there, Jerry. And it's like, um, then a judge gave me my oldest son full custody. Wow. He's 15 years old. And, um, you know, you ever hear that record scratch in the commercial or that tire squeal? They do that to sort of, it's called a pattern disrupt. And it's sort of, you have, it comes from neuro-linguistic programming. You have this pattern going and playing and all of a sudden you hear that, like you hear it in a commercial, be like, dun, 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 Okay, you get up in the morning, the alarm goes off, you make the breakfast, you get the kids dressed, you have to get them out the door, rush them, you know, make sure they're, make sure they're, uh, they're warm enough and, and get them to school and then, diarrhea <laughs> well that's what happened in my career it was a dun, 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 diarrhea you know <laughs> but my kid was feeling stressed his grades were coming down in high school he said dad i want to live with you uh, you know he's part of a three kid family with the twins and him he's the oldest I said oh, well i don't know and then he said dad i really mom's stressing me out and i said well now you know why dad doesn't live with mom um <laughs> She's a very A++ person, you know, um, and a lovely lady, just A++, you know, so it was just like, so uh, he wound up living with me and, um, you know, did uh, well in school, gave a big speech at the end of graduation, got a huge round of applause, a liberal kid in a conservative audience in Simi Valley. I was like, the whole time, you need any help with your speech? He goes, no, I got this, dad. Wow. And I was like, and he killed it. I was like, oh, fuck you. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and now he's uh, and uh, and his, uh, he's a third year law student at George yeah. Mason in uh, in D.C. So, hey, right. Yeah, that's all right. That was a, that was for me a worthwhile trade. And yeah. I sort of somebody sort of I was doing this writers forum at the Fri Friars Club helping guys who had a lot more experience than me improve their jokes. They would, you know, they'd say, wow, you're like the joke doctor. You seem to know why it doesn't work. How do you know this? Because I explored it at a different level, I think is what happened. I went down in the mechanics and the science and, and all that. And, um, and I figured out why it works. Certain stimuli are present. And how do you make sure that stimuli is present when you're doing the line? Oh, here, you can fix that like this. And he's like, oh, wow, now it works. How'd you do that? Um, so, what happened was one of the guys said, you should teach this. I said, oh, I don't want to be a teacher. That's, all, that's a sellout. You know, I don't want to sell out. And so he said one day, he says, I'm going to teach a seminar using some of your tools to the general public. And I said, that's a great idea. Yeah, feel free. And he's like, really? Okay, I will. So he sets up this free seminar on joke writing. The night before the seminar, he calls me with this voice. Hey, Jerry, it's Tony. I can't teach that class tomorrow. I got strep. <laughs> I think I got strep. Can you cover it for me? I go, oh yeah, sure, man. You sound horrible. You know, uh, get better. Uh, what do you, where do I get the keys and all? So he gave me all the info. I go down there, open the doors, like 40 people. And we get in there an hour and a half into this. He walks in, he goes, how's it going, man? I go, what happened to the voice? He goes, it was a ruse. He said, are you loving this? I go, I'm totally loving it. These people are writing jokes. They've never written a joke in their life. You know, yeah. to see that transformation in somebody and feel the joy they feel and the empowerment. Holy shit. That there's nothing that can match that feeling. Somebody, you know, coming back and giving you a bottle of Maker's Mark with a card that says, thanks for my career. It's like, oh, my God, what a feeling 
I didn't think there was a feeling that could top just being on stage. That's yeah. amazing because you have a real impact on somebody, on lots of people, and you, you could feel it. They could feel it. You give them, a, you know, they start to, to feel like empowered. And that's a great feeling. I still do corporates. I still go out on the road. I still do stuff. And um, I do different types of gigs now. You know, I did a, an event for Kaiser, you know, teaching 400 doctors in the morning, 400 in the afternoon, how to use humor in their clinic visits, you know. And uh, trust me, Kaiser likes to write checks. That's awesome. And it's like, uh, I didn't think that that could ever happen like that, that kind of money for one afternoon. Are you kidding me? So it's, and you're having a positive impact on people who are in a totally different profession, who, who will now have a positive impact on other people. So yeah, that is to me, I think a satisfaction. Plus I still write, I still write my screenplays. I still, you know, still doing that. I'm not, you know, and I'm just working, writing, writing every day, performing. And um, I think in the best part of my life right now, and also sharing this craft with other people. Yeah. So I, I know people who have careers because of you. Like Kevin, oh, so, yeah. Kevin Davis, we both started oh, at the same time. He got love hooked. Kevin. Yeah, man. Yeah. Great storyteller. And what Great. a smile on that guy, man. He's got a Sinbad like smile, but he's just charming AF. You know? <laughs> he is. He is. And nobody can out charm that guy. No, you know, he's no. just awesome. He's just such a kind person, you know, but he's yeah. a badass. The guy was a, a Marine, I think a master sergeant or something, a Marine for 25 years. Yes. So he's not a softy. He's just a very kind hearted man on the inside, you know? So it's like, yeah, he was great to have in class and he learned and he applied himself and he asked questions and he got better and he saw, oh, wow, you're right. I could have, right. And he just learned and learned and got better. So yeah, he was a, uh, He's a, he's a, he, and he constantly pushed and worked and marketed and sold himself. And he got out there and did the legwork and hit the pavement. And Such that's the other work. side of it. Show business is two words and business is in all caps, you know? Yes. So we forget that. Sometimes. I need to go get on out of here and mm -hmm. excuse myself. And I cannot thank you enough. And I want you to know, Jerry Corley, that anytime you want to promote anything, please come back. I hate Just, to um, yeah, put a time uh, capsule on this. That's okay. We can yeah. get the, uh, I, I had about an hour on it. I think we went a little over. Um, so, but um, <clears throat> they can always go to um, standupcomedyclinic.com and, and get the book, you know, the eBooks there. So um, you can download uh, that. It's in the eBook and we're, I'm now doing the uh, published version uh, should be out this year. So, um, but the eBook comes with all the, anytime I do an update, Anybody who buys that ebook gets the update automatically. So to everybody who's ever bought it, they one click, they get the new updated version with the with a lot of the updates. Because I'm talking in this new updated version, I'll be talking more about the expectation and how you know that's your you can use that to your advantage, like a magician knows that you're gonna fall for the misdirection because you can't multitask. So same thing we know as a as a comedian. So there's gonna be a couple of cool things in there that that update your knowledge of how audience responds to you and how they you know what they're what they see is you deliver it they're not going to figure out the joke you know they'll if you deliver it right they're not going to figure it out they're too linear they can't they can't think of two different answers at the same time wow so anyway um that's uh, that's one thing also the the a la carte classes i don't know if you've heard about that i'm doing the a la carte classes 25 dollars Yes, yeah, somebody said could you do something that's like a playbook where instead of a full class there's something that takes care of little niche parts of comedy where I feel like I might need some work in. Uh, and so I did a quick poll and they came back with what they were, what they wanted to learn. Um, and I came up with 12 classes, uh, a la carte classes, and I decided to price them at $25, the live one, just for the COVID thing. Cause you know, people are low on cash. And then um, if they miss that, they can get them, you know, so, sort of as the on-demand version for, uh, 20 bucks and they're three hour courses. They're not just surface introductory kind of webinar bullshit. You know, I'm just going to tease you a little bit with this. I go deep and I give them, I want them to leave learning a skill, walking away with that skill, go, holy shit. You know, I, I feel empowered. That's the goal. Right. So, wow. so great. It's a lot of fun. 
Lynn, well, thank, we thank, did it, right? We, we did, did it. it. We did it. Thank you so much for your time and coming on here and gracing the stage with your presence and your thanks, knowledge. Thanks for having me on. And I uh, love your passion for what you yeah. do. The world wouldn't be the same without you. Thank, thank you, so you so much. much. That's very kind. Serving all these people. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you. We'll see I'll you again. See you later. All right. Bye. bye. Everybody's talking.